Good morning, Temple Baptist Church. It's November 29th. I'm glad you could join us. Since Christmas is right around the corner and everybody's thinking about Christmas and getting ready for Christmas, uh, maybe you have your Christmas tree up. We don't have ours up yet, uh, but we're planning on doing it out here pretty soon. Since it's around the corner, I want to start sharing about Christmas, some passages about the birth of Christ, uh, getting us ready for Christmas. Um, hopefully, this month we might be able to have some fellowships or something this month where we can uh, celebrate Christmas together. And I'll give a call out, call all out to you uh, to, to let you know what, what we'll be doing, okay? All right, so let's uh, look in Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew, looking in Matthew. And uh, we're going to look in Matthew chapter 1. And I want to focus this morning on the gospel in the names of the Christ. That's what we're going to look at. If you will take your Bibles, Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 1, and then I'm going to read verses 17 through 23, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get going, okay? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now move down to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. I pray, God, you will help us to learn what you'd have us to learn out of this passage. Speak to us uh, from your spirit, from your word. And Lord, I pray you'll bless those who are listening to this. Uh, Lord, I pray that this will challenge us as we worship you this Christmas season. For it's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. So there are two names given here for the Christ. And those two names are Jesus and Emmanuel. And we're going to be looking at those here this morning. But first, I want to just share with you some things before we get to that. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, is, is one that focuses on the kingdom of God and its king. So you have the kingdom of God and its king. Those who are in the kingdom and the king of the kingdom. And an interesting part of here that, that, that underscores that is in the genealogy. And I want to mention some things I think is interesting out of this genealogy. Uh, the genealogy of Jesus here, it says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It's interesting because Matthew's mentioning, he says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He uses the word genealogy, which is the word that we get the same word out of the book of Genesis. So when you read that, it's almost as if, in fact, intentionally, Matthew is getting us to think back at Genesis. Because G Genesis is known as the book of generations. You find the very first, the second chapter of Genesis, it tells us in the, the generations of the creation of the heaven and the earth. The book of the generations of the creation of heaven and the earth. You also have, talking about the generations of Adam and Eve, the generations of, of Noah, the generations going on, on throughout the entire book. So that's known as the book of generations. Interesting that Matthew, when he puts us here, 
He ties us to that book. That's going to be important here later in our discussion here, but just hold on to that. But look at the genealogy. There's some, something really interesting that Matthew makes sure that we see. Um, in the genealogy, we have five people that are mentioned in this genealogy that are outsiders to the kingdom, to Israel. They're outsiders. The first one is Tamar. Tamar's mentioned. It talks about, and usually when you do a genealogy, it's like in, in verse 2 there, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father. They mention the fathers and then the sons. But in here you see five people that are interjected that are either the mothers or somebody else. And those five, is the first one is Tamar. And she says, it says here, Tamar... Uh, Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. And so something about Tamar that was distinct enough for Matthew to, to make note of her. Then the second one was, a, the second person is Rahab. It says in verse, in verse 5, Solomon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. Something about Rahab that took, uh, took Matthew's notice, and he note her as well. And then the, the, the third one was Ruth. Ruth. It says, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. By Ruth. Okay? Now the first three are all women. And they're all, if you notice, they're all outsiders. Tamar was an outsider. And Rahab was an outsider. Rahab was the harlot uh, of Jericho. Ruth was an outsider. She was a Moabitess. All these are outsiders that, um, that are mentioned by Matthew, and they were all women. But this next one is interesting. The fourth one here that kind of, uh, that's kind of got us curious is wife of Uriah, the wife of Uriah. It says, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now we know who the name of Uriah's wife was. I mean, it says it in the Old Testament. Her name is Bathsheba. But for some reason, Matthew does not mention her name. He mentions instead her husband's name. Now, what does her husband have to do in the genealogy of Jesus? What do any of these people have to do? Obviously, we know in the genealogy of Jesus, Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth, they're mothers of children that eventually become uh, Jesus and they're outsiders. But we see the wife of Uriah. Uriah is an outsider. He's a Hittite. Bathsheba's not a, an outsider. She's an, actually an Israelite. But we're reminded of a very painful story of how David had Uriah, a very honorable man, killed in battle to cover up his adulterous affair with his wife Bathsheba. Okay? But why is Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Uriah mentioned. Now let me give you my, my, number one, I think it's because they're outsiders. They're included here. Number two, I think it was because they were more committed to the kingdom of God than those who were in the kingdom were. Okay? And that's important because you see Tamar, uh, it, was, it was Judah said of Tamar, she's more righteous than I. Because Tamar wanted to provide a kinsman redeemer so that he would not go childless. If it wasn't for Tamar's insistence, we would not have the bloodline of Jesus. It would have, been, it would have stopped right there. So Tamar insisted on it. Rahab it was noted for her faith in allowing the spies to spy out the land. So she was, she was committed to the kingdom of God as well. Ruth was extremely committed to the kingdom of God. She told, she told Naomi, she said, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. And in fact, it was at the end of the book of Ruth that they said, she's better, she's better to you, Naomi, she's better to you than seven sons. Ruth, she's talking about Ruth. And then Uriah, Uriah I believe is in here because he is an outsider, but yet he is more committed to the kingdom than in even David was. He wouldn't even, he wouldn't even go home and be at home with his wife when David tried to bring him home. He was so noble, he slept in the square. He slept in the, in the soldiers' quarters instead of going home because he was so committed to the kingdom. 
And what we see is a pattern, and we'll see that all throughout the book of Matthew. You've got people who display the characteristics of a person, of a character of those who belong in this kingdom versus those who do not. Even though there's people who are labeled uh, as being members of the kingdom or citizens of the kingdom, they actually show that they're not. And then you have these others who aren't necessarily uh, members of the kingdom, but yet they show they are by their faith or by what they do throughout the book of Matthew. And this is a theme that we see throughout the book of Matthew. Now, did I say five? Yes, I did. The fifth person is Joseph himself. You go down through there and you see the description of Joseph. It goes down there. Verse 16 says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, it says, the husband of Mary, whom Jesus was born. So he's known as the husband of Mary. He's not the one that Jesus, he was not the father of Jesus. He's just the husband of Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. So Joseph was an outsider too. And even though he was of the bloodline, he was an outsider because he was not the father of Jesus. But... Joseph was declared just and righteous as well because when he found out, it talks about in verse 19, when he found out that Mary was pregnant, he says, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to to divorce her quietly. It says he was a just man. So all these others were righteous, were just in their dealings as well as Joseph. So they were outsiders and they were righteous. For the writer, Matthew, this was important. Because you remember, Matthew was a tax collector. He was an outsider. No one would have had anything to do with Matthew as far as the things of God. But yet Jesus invites him. He says, follow me. And Matthew left his tax office and followed Jesus. So he was an outsider. And yet he became a person who was in the kingdom because the king invited him in. So Matthew presents all throughout his book those who live for the kingdom and versus those who do not live for the kingdom. And also we have here the virgin birth. It's important to note the reason why is everybody's an outsider because nobody can do this right like God can. And so we have the, the virgin birth, which means... It's not through human means, but by the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, the genealogy of Jesus is by the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now it is important that Matthew has worded it this way, from the Holy Spirit. Because they had, in a lot of the Greek mythologies and Roman mythologies, they had it where the gods would uh, have intercourse with women, and they would have these demigods. But the way Matthew words this is very precise, in such a way as you cannot, you cannot say that God, here this is a case of God having intercourse with a woman, and then they're having, they're having children. Because, he says, from the Holy Spirit. And the first place we see Holy Spirit is in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Let me go there real quick. Genesis chapter 1. What we see the Holy Spirit, what He's doing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We see the Holy Spirit working. We see Him at work there in creation. And He brings about the grass and the trees from the earth. He brings about the beasts of the field. He brings about the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. He brings about man, the creation of man. All this without intercourse. So, so Matthew is tying this into Genesis to show you that this is a spiritual thing that happens. When, when Mary gets pregnant, it's not, of a human, it's not of human means, it's not physical, but it's of God. God is doing His creative act like He did 
in the book of Genesis in bringing Jesus into this world. So it refers back to Genesis. So there's no one like Jesus. And this is what Matthew wants us to see. So look at this, the two names that they give. It says here in verse 21, uh, She will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus. Jesus is the Greek word. The Hebrew word is Joshua or Yeshua. But those are shortened forms the Hebrew actual long word for Yeshua or Joshua is Jehoshua. And when you go back to that longer form, it means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. So Jesus means, the word Jesus, the shorter version, it actually means Yahweh or Jehovah saves. And the angel of the Lord, it says here, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. It, the angel actually specifically gave this name to Joseph to give to his child. Jesus means Yahweh saves. Now I want you to notice, we go down there in verse 21. If we were to substitute the word Yahweh saves for the name Jesus, listen to how this, how this sounds. In verse 21, she will bear you a son, you shall call his name Yahweh saves, for He will save His people from their sins. Yahweh saves. Very clearly, Matthew is declaring from the angel, actually the angel is declaring that Jesus is Yahweh. He's Yahweh saves. He is God who is working to save His people from their sins. So that's what Jesus means. But notice what else it says. It says, save His people. Now the question would come to mind is, who are His people that He's saving? I thought He was come to save the whole world. Not just His people, but what about the whole world? His people means his, it's His kingdom. His people is, is referring to Israel. And Israel, when God separated Israel to be the blessing to all the nations. So his people actually would be those, the Israelites, but also those who are out of the nations who become Israelites. He said, through Abraham, all nations will be blessed. Through Abraham. Through David's throne, the Christ will rule the nations. So his people are those, are those people who have faith in Christ. And we'll show you that here pretty soon. Here pretty soon. It says, save his people from their sins. It's very specific as to what they're to be saved from. Sin. Not the Roman Empire, not, uh, not, not uh, Babylon, not any of these other things. It says He shall come to save their people from their sins. There, there was a sin problem in mankind from the very beginning. The Garden of Eden. Remember, Adam and Eve had sinned in the Garden of Eden. That sin went to the first murder, and then God decided to destroy the whole earth with a flood eventually to, to eradicate the sin problem and began it over with Noah. It wasn't very long until after Noah was born, you had the Tower of Babel, and sin was rampant again, the sin problem. And then God separated out of the nations one man out of the nations, Abraham, and from that nation, in that nation, God says, I'm going to bless the whole world, I'm going to save the world. But yet you find out that Abraham and his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, all of them have been, uh, have been sinful, have sinned all down through there. Over and over again, Israel had broken their covenant with God and was not faithful. And so God sent them into the exile to be banished into Babylon, Babylonian exile. And so the sin problem had persisted until then. So God said, I will save my people from their sins, mankind, in a sin problem. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. It says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, 
alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So we become the people of God by faith in Jesus. And by coming to Jesus, He saves us from our sins. He saves us from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death and damnation. We're forgiven of those sins. Through Him, we're also saved from the power of sin. That's our slavery to it. We're set free from it because we died to sin when Christ died on a cross. We also shall be saved from the, or we are being saved from the practice of sin, our lifestyle. It says in Galatians 1 4, it says, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. And 2 Peter 1 4 says, He has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So Jesus died to save us from the sins that we see around us, from the sins of alcoholism, pornography, from the sins of gambling, from the sins of murder, from the sins of stealing, from the sins of dishonesty, from the sins of, of disrespecting our parents, from the sins of covetousness. All of these sins, Jesus came to save us from those sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death that will produce death within us. And so Jesus came to save us from those sins. Those who are enter into Christ will be saved from those sins. So that's good, the good news, what we're seeing out of Matthew, what Matthew wants us to see. Now Matthew, if you remember, he was a sinner. He was called a tax collector, a sinner, a publican, a worthless no-count by everybody else. But Jesus had mercy upon him and saved him from his sins and called him with a high calling. The second name that Jesus is given here, it's first one's Jesus. So when we see the word Jesus, it means Yahweh saves, right? He saves. Uh, the second word is Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And Matthew translate this, translates this for us. He actually quotes from Isaiah, but he translates this in parentheses. In verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Which means God with us. This is the second part of the gospel. The first part of the gospel is that God saves us from our sins, but that's not all there is to the gospel because the second part of the gospel is that God not only erases our sins from us but now he gives us something to enables enable us to live a life that he called us to live and that's God with us his holy spirit it, this passage refers to Isaiah, Isaiah 7:14 it is to assure king Ahaz that God is going to act in delivering from the king of Assyria in the book of Romans, you go through Romans through to chapter 8, and it tells us about the Holy Spirit who lives, we're led, those of us who are led by the Spirit, we are the children of God, and how the Holy Spirit helps us to live the way God wants us to live. Galatians tells us, talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He talks about that. If we walk in the Spirit, we don't need the law. We, we have no need of the law because we're fulfilling the law as we walk in the Spirit. So we're allowing God's Holy Spirit to live within us. I think about the tabernacle in the wilderness. How is Moses and the children of Israel, how are they going to obtain the promised land? How are they going to defeat the enemies? How are they going to be fed? How are they going to do any of that stuff? It's by the supply of God's power because God is with them. In fact, there was a moment in time in, in, in Exodus chapter 38 where Moses tells God, he says, God, we cannot do this if your presence does not go with us to accomplish these things. And God said, well, you're right. And Moses was yearning and desiring for God's presence to be within him. And so this is the second part of the good news. When Jesus was born into this world, it meant that we could be saved from our sins, 
but also that God's presence can be with us. That we will know, all of us can know God from the least of us to the greatest of us. That God's presence is in our lives. That is the good news. And that really is, should be part of the Christmas message that we should embrace. That Christ is born within us. That Jesus comes to live inside our lives, into our hearts. That He can live within us and live through us and empower and enable our disability. Colossians 1.27 says this. It says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's the hope of a meth addict or a cocaine addict or a drug addict or an alcoholic or, or somebody who has some kind of vice what is the hope that they will be able to escape that? What is the hope that they can live beyond that? It's Christ living inside them. Christ who is their power in their light helping them to do that. Our confidence shouldn't be in ourselves. The Apostle Paul said, I do not have any confidence in my flesh, but my confidence is in Christ. Christ who lives within me, enabling me to do the work. And so this is where we have the hope of glory. The hope of God's power working in us to do that which we cannot do. Can I forgive my enemy? No, I can't do it. I can't do it without God's power. But God's Spirit enables us to do that which we cannot do. Can we love our enemy? Yes, we can through the power of Christ. We can do all kinds of things through Christ who strengthens us. And so this is part of the Christmas message. And we need to ask ourselves, I've received the forgiveness of Christ, but have I, am I receiving His life? Am I appropriating His life in my life, allowing Him to live through me and to be Christ in me? And this is the blessing. Matthew was an outsider. He was an outcast. For him, Jesus was good news of being saved from sin and having God with him. Can you imagine someone like Matthew with no hope of God ever being in his life? of being, the, being thought of as a traitor to the people of God because he was a tax collector. But yet, Matthew was a man that Jesus called to be with him, and Matthew was a man who got a front row seat as to the miracles and as to the teaching, as to all the things that Jesus did. Matthew was able to see that. So the same is true for you and me. Yahweh saves, and He is with us. We, uh, Temple Baptist Church, we are a community brought together by this good news. We need to live by these truths and allow them to transform us. And it has been transforming people for 2,000 years. It is a message that we receive. It is a message not only do we receive it, but we also pass it on to other people. So I ask you the question, have you, been rece have you received this message? Are you living by it? Are you living by faith? in this message and are you passing it on to somebody else are you giving this to somebody else we're not here to make people church people we're not here to make church people out of people we're here to make people who to know christ and to be christians to become people who know christ and will love him 